five months. Watch has been on my wrist for five months now, and now it's finally time <laughs> to share a review. Uh, it's been a whirlwind, actually. It's been a hell of an experience because it represents a lot more than just being a first tutor. It's also you know, the culmination of events, the end of an era, and summing up a lot of what I've done on this channel, where I began and where I am now. It means a lot for that reason, so enjoy it. It's going to be a long one. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. The Pelagos FXD has changed me as a collector. I know it sounds wishy-washy, but hear me out. I've been in this hobby for seven years and collecting for the last five years. This piece is the culmination of this channel, of my journey when I began. And I feel so incredibly fortunate to finally have a piece like this that represents that milestone event. So this video is going to cover my background with the watch, my experience of getting the watch and having it on the wrist for five months. And it was great fun reading what everyone expected I would pick up from 925 Black Bays to GMTs and chronographs. Some of you might be disappointed that I didn't go down that route, but there are many good reasons why this watch in particular stuck with me. But there's also lots of you out there who guessed right, and if you're following my Instagram, you would probably know that I've been sharing this watch every other week. Is this the most special watch I've ever picked up? The answer would be no. The Seamaster still takes that spot. Because it was my first luxury watch, there's a great tie of sentimentality with it. This has been my most satisfying watch purchase to date. And it goes far deeper than saying that this is my first Tudor. It's easily the first watch from the brand that I've ever bonded with. And it addresses everything I've ever wanted from a Tudor. And that is so important today. But the best way I could sum up this entire experience in one word, cathartic. So this video will cover my background with the watch, my love of its history and design, my experience when trying to get it at ADs, etc. The ups and downs with it, as well as the time I've had with it after being on my wrist for five months. It's seldom that I ever really talk about my watch experiences here, but this is one of those rare occasions. So expect it to be quite long. There are going to be timestamps in the description, but expect to get a full summary of this watch, why I love it so much, what it represents far more than being something in the metal. And whoever you are out there who sent me this shirt, you're a legend, you know who you are. Let's get into the video. If you followed my channel for a while, you'll know that I have a history with this design. I started taking this channel seriously when I thought that documenting the designs of models would be fun. And the snowflake dial versus the submariner dial was a no-brainer in the early days. These were some of the first videos that I ever did on the subject and really what kickstarted this whole concept of breaking down and critiquing designs. I think it's clear to say that from the very beginning, the snowflake design was always in the back of my mind. Then over the years, I dedicated countless hours studying the history of mil-spec watches, whether British, American, French, German, Italian. And my love of military pieces comes from that marriage between function and design. How all of these watches exhibit clear and concise messages about their purpose. How they all are so well presented in a neat, almost regimental fashion that don't draw attention to themselves. And some of the best designs of all time, I believe, belong to mil-spec pieces because they only ever were created to be used as instruments, not as fashionable accessories and such covert designs that naturally they ended up being works of art. And I've been so incredibly fortunate over the years to get hands-on experience with these pieces. Some of the rarest, like the Rolex 5517 Millsub, the FAP Speedmaster, the MOD Seamaster, and of course, Tudor Snowflake Submariners. Getting these models in the flesh to see these proportions, to understand their sizes and what they were built for, you know, being built for purpose. Downside of an experience like this is you get hands-on with a rarer than hen's teeth Tudor Snowflake Submariner issued to the South African Navy only for the course of one year. And then you look at the price. For someone like me who has such a deep love for these pieces, only to see the price get in the way of that possible enjoyment, unfortunately that is the state of the watch world today. So in the middle of 2021, Tudor makes this announcement that they're going to be partnering up with the Marine Nationale. And the diehard collectors out there are like, what? This is insane. Why aren't we hearing more about this? I think a lot of us in the background were thinking, how is this not big news? And then later on in the year, I made a predictions video of sorts, and then the leaks finally started. One of you out there shared the leaks with me, which I'm so grateful for. And from that, I created a whole load of renders a week before the official release. Then the FXD arrived on the scene. Slimmer case, fixed bars, fully graduated bezel insert, no date. Just that alone, I was sold. It felt to me like they adjusted everything that I didn't necessarily enjoy about the original Pelagos. And I can honestly say that I have never been more obsessed with the release of a watch. It came out a week before my birthday. Doesn't really matter very much, but you know, it became a wallpaper watch. It became the piece that was on my laptop, on my phone screens. 
Now it was clear to me, judging by the release, judging by the build up, what this piece represents, that this was it. So this was the model for me. Of course, then the only issue was finding one. Different parts of the world have experienced shortages. Some have received more than others. All of my local authorized dealers, even as far back as February this year, hadn't even received one. I had no idea when they would be getting it. Of course, put me on the list. I think I was 16th in the one and 14th in the other. Then the MN21 madness happened. You know, the engravings on the case back. Man, it got me angry. I can't put into words how much it irritated me. Because now the people who truly want the watch, what it represents, the history it has with the Marine National, that whole relationship, they have to be deprived so that the flexes can share that they now have the XFD or DFX. They don't even care about the name. It's the way the world works now, but man, it got me angry. The sad thing is, and I've learned this over the months, is that these models will always have this less than average production tied to them. I don't believe that Tudor ever wanted this watch to be produced as much as the standard Pelagos, the Black Bay, and the rest. Even now, they are in short supply. Anyway, for a few months, I got away from looking at the watch on platforms. I kept telling myself that when the moment would present itself, this would be my next pickup. But the obsession was something real. I think most of you can relate to this. Every day, every night, I'd be scouring new reviews, absorbed every little bit of information there was about the watch. So after going back to the 80s again and asking and being told there is no foreseeable change and odds are one will arrive every month, but they had no idea when, doing the number crunching and realizing that this would likely affect my psychological well-being and my enthusiasm with this hobby, I said, that's it, cray market. Wouldn't you know, by the end of that exact week, a model came up online with a very reasonable asking price. I must have paid 250 over retail. This was because it wasn't an MN21, something that I was hopeful about, more on that later. My justification, this watch would never leave me. I had made up my mind, sight unseen, that this watch would be special. It arrived in the post a few days later. The unboxing was incredible, still had all of its stickers. Got it on the wrist. I didn't share anything about it to friends, to family. Didn't share it on social media for about two months. That is all she wrote. Five months later, yes, I am still on the list. No, I haven't received any calls yet. The FXD integrated into the collection from the get-go, and this is what I've found time and time again. Unlike most pieces when you're deciding what you're going to do with it on the day, you sometimes have to make your choices depending on the activity. But over the last five months, the FXD is the kind of watch that always just seems to raise its hand and be like, yep, I'll do it. So exercising, running, calisthenics, swimming, barbecuing, writing this video, this watch has been on my wrist. It is so unashamedly built for function that it never feels inappropriate. And that's exactly why I love it. This could also be equally why many people wouldn't enjoy this watch. Let's branch into sharing some actual information about the watch, not reading off a brochure, but let's talk about the legitimate facts about the origins of this piece, where it comes from. Tudor worked in collaboration with Commander Hubert to create this piece. They are a very tight-knit specialist branch of the Marine National. And while many have said that this is a great marketing exercise and nothing more, I have it on good authority that not only are the two-line dial models being used actively, but these civilian four-line FXD models are also being used by this unit. It needs to be said these watches are not issued to the Marine National, only specialist units, the Commando Hubert being one of them. So why is this release really so significant? Why has it impacted me more than any other Tudor watch? The simple fact of the matter is, without the Marine National collaboration, this partnership that they had with Tudor between the 1950s and the 1980s, the snowflake dial, the snowflake handset that we know and love today, would not exist. Tudor owes the success of this design to the French Navy. They had the idea, they trialed them, and made them so popular in the first place. Navies around the world cottoned on to how good these pieces were and requested the snowflakes for their forces. The rest is history. Seeing this partnership happening again is so fantastic because it's cyclical. 50 years on and this unit were given carte blanche to come up with any model that they wanted modernized and specifically opted for the larger Pelagos case over the Black Bay. They wanted the bars on the case to be fixed, the bezel to be fully graduated with luminous everywhere, the ability to rotate it in both directions timing short stints underwater. But it gets even more nerdy than that when the designers knew that eliminating anything reflective on the watch was important. You will notice that the rarest MN snowflakes also have fully brushed sides as well as tops. 
The FXD could be seen as an exercise of stripping away the unnecessary for the sake of it being lighter, less cumbersome, with no points of failure. Virtually everything on this watch is bespoke compared to the standard Pelagos. The case, the dial, the bezel, bezel insert, the crown, even the hands are slightly different. And I do see this as the prototype for the next generation of pieces coming out soon from Tudor. To the questions, is this an MN21 or 22? It's a 22. Why is that important? Why didn't I choose the rarer than rare 21? If you break up the letters phonetically, Mike November 22. My name is not Mike, but I was born November 22nd. So I got my birthday already engraved on the case back. Now to the actual experience and the review portion. Why have I bonded so well with this watch apart from everything already said? The build quality and attention to detail. There is a reason why Tudor is eating up the watch marketplace. The movement's phenomenal. Not as accurate day to day as my Omega, but being on my wrist for three weeks straight, the watch has gained two seconds. 70 hour power reserve, it winds like butter. Do we want to do a bezel test? Okay. You don't have to say much, do you? So it may not look like much at first glance, but once you get into it, this piece offers you everything that a dive watch should. Just the simple things like the matte finish and the color of blue chosen. I don't use the word often, but their choice of deep navy for this dial and bezel is perfect. It's extremely low in profile, it changes color in every light. You can see in the artificial light, it looks more like the original Pelagos Blue. This is a very different hue to the Black Bay 58 Blue. Far more muted indoors, but it beams outside and in direct light. And a blue Tudor with a snowflake dial, I mean, you can't argue with that, it's the signature. Now to the size and proportions for a modern day dive watch. It's absolutely sublime. I was skeptical at first. I mean, it was quite daunting taking this piece out of the box and comparing its size to, say, my Seamaster 57. I have a seven inch wrist on a good day and it wears fine. You shouldn't be deterred by the numbers. 52 mil lug length, it wears like a 49. It wears smaller than a 41 millimeter watch. Lug length is always what matters. The best comparison I could give when I got this watch on the wrist is it felt like a Sea Dweller 43. Not as thick, much lighter, but the presence was the same. The lugs on this watch are slightly longer than the typical Black Bay 58, but please don't let it deter you. You can see a good comparison of this size next to my Seiko SPB. I also love how they've integrated the Skin Diver square lug look into this case. It's very subtle and is never noticeable. Just a touch more detail that adds a point of difference. It's actually quite period correct when you think that this watch is taking its inspirations from the late 60s, early 70s. The size of the hands, the plots on the dial, all scaled appropriately. The fact that they shifted the dial of this watch up so high that it nearly touches the crystal means that there's barely any distortion when it's underwater. The crystal is flat on top but boxed underneath and it cancels the highly reflective quality that you get from Rolex crystals in direct light. The all matte finish of this watch means that it's never reflective when you don't want it to be. Since the case is all titanium, the extra size means nothing because it's so lightweight and wears low in profile. The sharp knurled teeth of the bezel, the big professional crown, the modified pointed crown guards, the loom on this watch. Attention to detail again. These are all small adjustments that to the naked eye doesn't really mean very much, but man does it improve the experience. Now the four lines of text on this watch could be criticized, but I find it was done well. At first it took some getting used to. If you know me, I like to criticize anything that has more than two lines of text on a dial. But since this is bigger than your average dial, the type takes up a lot of that vacant space and the way it has been arranged in a diamond shape also corresponds with the snowflake hand. The hook and loop Velcro strap, whatever you want to call it, is superb. Fantastic weave. It's one of the most interesting weaves of a NATO I've ever experienced. Of course, they were going for zero failure with this watch and having spring bars, having any kind of connecting screw would have affected that. The buckle is neatly done and finished. I really appreciate that they signed their logo on it, but the grip of the Velcro will eventually fade over time. So here's a quick hack. Sacrifice one of your 22 millimeter NATOs and secure the keeper. When you're putting it on the wrist, Slide this little keeper over the tongue, just like that, indestructible. I also recommend getting yourself as many straps as possible. This machine is made for strap configurations, but the strap that it comes standard with, don't fear that it's going to wear out. Don't fear that the material is going to get damaged. It's much hardier than you think. This comes from someone who's been exercising with it on asphalt, who has sweated in it, who's been in the sun, been in the water with it. I don't even think it's changed in color. Does it bother me that this watch never came with a bracelet? I'm one of the few out there that wear 95% of my watches on straps, including divers, so no. I much prefer the thought that this watch would never fall off my wrist accidentally. 
I can't tell you how much more confidence it gives you to go wild with it. Now the great question that has been the topic of debate for a long time. Does this watch deserve to be called a Pelagos? It's done away with the helium escape valve. It's removed the bracelet and the excellence clasp. It's removed the date. The purists, I would say me included, will say that they have stripped everything away from this watch that made it so unique and special for the sake of convenience. And I've thought about this for a while. Given this choice, I would have taken the name Pelagos off the dial. I know the brand obviously feels obligated to give it a name. This is their Submariner after all. But simply calling this watch the Tudor FXD, engraving FXD on the case back and leaving it at that, it would be brilliant. It needs to be said that this model deviates so far away from being a Pelagos, it's almost entirely bespoke, everything. It could have been a different property. It may be lighter, it may have less tech, it may be far more convenient to wear, but it needs to be said that so much care and attention and detail went into the parts that were considered. I've come to the conclusion that over time, this was a watch that was made with someone like me in mind. You know, as far as purpose-built, professional-made dive watches go, this one has addressed everything I have ever wanted. It addressed everything I disliked about modern Rolex dive watches. My aim was to have a Submariner by the time I hit 30. Now I'm not even looking at it anymore. And this is how the watch has changed me as an enthusiast. Since this purchase, I have not looked at or considered adding another watch to the collection. I've even gone so far to consider downsizing just to get more enjoyment out of a smaller collection. It's that one watch that feels like the culmination of years of studying, of learning the history, of designing, and hoping that something like this would become a reality and would cross paths with me. And it did arrive, and it has surpassed my expectations, and has become a cornerstone watch in my humble collection. It's got all of the history and background linked to some of the most impressive modern divers of today, including the icons like the Submariner, but has way less fanfare. Let's be honest, the majority don't care about its history, how beautifully designed it was, considered, and what it represents. That part is for me. And if I didn't have a channel, I probably never would have shared it with anyone. This might sound crazy to end this video off, but hear me out. I have this odd theory that the Pelagos owners out there have this unspoken bond with their watch. And this I've found out more and more over the years. I ran into an enthusiast once. He's an independent writer and he works for a well-known watch magazine. When he got the job, he was trying to decide what he was going to wear as his daily piece into the office. Nothing pretentious, nothing to show off, just something simple. And he chose the Pelagos. So I asked him, for how long? And he said, oh, eight years. That's a testimonial. That's the kind of testimonial that a watch like this deserves. And the real difference between something that is good and great. That was a monster to put together. Glad it's out, I'm glad it's finally done. You know why I love it so much? Is because now I can share this watch in videos and you know, I get the full enjoyment out of wearing it while recording. The only time I've been taking this watch off is to record videos, but now the truth is out there, I can rock it. You know, I finally understand, with my limited experience of this watch, why Pelagos owners love their pieces so much. If you're someone who is on the fence about choosing this piece, I would say just go for it. If you have any reservations about the size proportions, I wouldn't say you should worry about it too much. I wanted this video, I think, to summarize that this piece represents a lot more than the sum of its parts, and I think the best watches manage to do that. It celebrates a milestone and this culmination of a great history that the brand has. I think it was done so well, so effectively handled. This journey has taught me a lot about finding your tastes, knowing your tastes, and connecting with the watch far beyond the materialistic levels. So thank you so much for watching this clip, for following me along this journey if you have from the very beginning, and for watching me close out this chapter.